Good morning, by the way. Thank you for coming this morning. I had my first good night's sleep, so at first I was excited that it was this early in the morning, but when I was actually waking up, I wasn't that excited. Um, but thank you for coming. So um, this talk is a little different than the other talks. I've done projects, um, a lot of projects with uh, machine learning and audio, um, something that I have called in my own publications, distant listening, other people have called it that. Uh, and this, I'm going to get to that in the end, not in any great detail, but with some sort of thoughts about it. Um, and what this is really more is uh, a sort of look at what close listening um, affords and why maybe distant listening in some ways for me felt like it wasn't quite getting there. So Zora Neale Hurston um, is an ethnographer, novelist, and, uh, well, let me start there. So uh, I recently wrote a book that had come out in 2024 where I talk about all of these things, um, and I'm going to get to some of the things that I talk about and that um, I refer to as, as principles of resonance. Um, but the recordings I'm going to talk about today are recordings from 1935 and from the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress, and then I'll get to the other stuff. Um, and the current project that I'm working on, which is more about close listening, which is called Audi Annotate. I encourage you to look at that because I'm not really going to talk about that today, but that's kind of where this work is heading. And then questions. So um, this idea of resonance um, first is about the material particularity, particular, particularities of the apparatus. Secondly, about meaning making being dialogic. And thirdly, that resonance is agential, which means that in some ways it's co-constructed by a field of meanings where the scholar has some agency and the machine has some agency in what kinds of meanings we make. So Zora Neale Hurston. She was an ethnographer, novelist, and dramatist. She was a collector, speaker, and performer, and a recorder of other people's stories in her own black folklore in the United States in the 20s and 30s. She was trained at Barnard College in the 1920s under the supervision of anthropologist Franz Boas and completed ethnographic fieldwork in Alabama, the Bahamas, Florida, Georgia, Haiti, Jamaica, and New Orleans. In the 1930s alone, she wrote numerous short stories, journal articles, books, and musicals based on her life in Eatonville, Florida. Most scholars seem to agree that Hurston bucked any sort of normative representation of black folk, no matter how complicated, writing in her autobiography, Dust Tracks on a Road, about African Americans in the U.S., that there is no the Negro here. Our lives are so diversified, internal, attitudes so varied, appearances and capabilities so different, that there is no possible classification so Catholic that it will cover us all except my people, my people. Person has famously described how her own recording methods are entangled in the community's practices of folk. I just get in the crowd, she says, with the people if they're singing, and I listen as best as I can, and I start to join in with a phrase or two, and then finally I get so I can sing a verse, and then I keep on until I learn all the song, all the verses, and then I sing them back to the people until they tell me I can sing them just like them. I'm going to actually bring back her picture. Hurston's methods of recording folklore comprise a complex process of trying to represent a culture that actively resists dominant means of representation. Unfortunately, the intermedia, multi-genre expressions, and general lack of fixity in Hurston's work also resist current modes of archival preservation and categorization, making her creative process difficult to study. A few scholars have written about the recordings that are the main concern of this talk, including approximately 75 brief tracks songs, stories, and explanations from a recording trip Hurston took in 1935 to Florida and Georgia with Alan Lomax and Mary Elizabeth Barnacle for the Library of Congress, and that's who's pictured here. A primary reason for the silence and scholarship about Hurston's recordings is that close listening for Hurston is difficult work. It must be pre precipitated by acts of preservation and access that include transposing the original acetate discs to reel-to-reel -reel tapes and then digitizing them. Access is also determined by how the original catalogers described or did not describe her work and influence in ways that still dictate the means by which scholars hear these recordings through metadata and online curations today. This notion of metadata um, is very important, not only in the context of doing this research, but in any kind of context of doing machine learning, because we depend on metadata so much to frame the context of what we listen to in computational ways. And oftentimes that metadata, as I'll show you today, is not accurate, um, and it may even be, in many cases, as we know, biased um, and a false representation of culture and history. 
At the same time, unpublished, unpublished manuscripts of plays and stories and essays by Hurston are few and rough, and her working field notes do not exist. Consequently, her distorted recordings, which disrupt how institutions preserve recordings and make them discoverable, are important traces of Hurston's early work in the field and how she came to shape her writings on race and identity. Distortions, I argue, are a twisting awry or an out of shape. They are what Hurston would call something off key from an expectation. Figuratively, distortion is a word misapplication, a perversion of words so as to give them a different sense. But in sound, it is a change in the waveform of a signal by an electronic device such as an amplifier or during transmission from one point to another, usually impairing the quality of its reproduction. Distortion happens during the process and production of use, but distortion is a perception. A person with a limited vocabulary might not perceive that a word has been used incorrectly. Similarly, while an audio engineer listening for and expecting a certain audio quality could describe listening to a distorted signal as having a little sense of unease or a feeling that things aren't quite right, an inexperienced or uncritical listener might not sense an aberration. Besides, distortions are not without their pleasures. Malapropisms can be illuminating, and sound distortions in music can be expressive and, an on, and on key for a situation. Importantly, a diverted expectation can be an opportunity for reflection and for reconsidering the processes by which perceptions of what is right occur. It is significant to understanding the role the audio recording played in Hurston's work to situate its technical and social distortions in the Jim Crow South surveillance culture. Alan Lomax and Stetson Kennedy both recall the trouble they had with police during their involvement with Hurston and the Florida workers in 1935. According to Lomax's biography, Hurston advised Lomax and fellow ethnographer Mary Elizabeth Barnacle to darken their faces with walnut oil in order to avoid trouble with local police as they traveled through African-American neighborhoods. Nevertheless, Lomax was picked up at least twice by local authorities for simply being with Hurston and talking to the black workers. Kennedy also recalls how their 1939 field work, Hurston would be compelled to sleep in her car when hotels would not welcome her, and further observed that segregation, quote, was enforced by police car, vigilante, peer group, Ku Klux Klan, or whatever. You could just get, you could get killed lighting someone's cigarette or shaking hands, both parties, black and white. They did get killed, end quote. Understanding Hurston as both surveillant and surveillant is an acknowledgement of the means by which she inserted herself into the complex subjectivation process that was inherent in 1930s anthropological fieldwork of black folk. In a surveillance culture like the Jim Crow South, surveillance, or the act of recording the recorders, can become a site of critique as it speaks to black epistemologies. This is a quote from Simone Brown of contending with anti-black surveillance, end quote. Much as, quote, the tools of social control and plantation surveillance or lantern laws in city spaces and beyond were appropriated, co-opted, repurposed, and challenged in order to facilitate survival and escape. In Mules and Men, Hurston imagines that the surveyed black man would say when asked about the theory behind her tactics for resisting the white man, quote, always trying to know into somebody else's business. She writes, I'll set something outside the door of my mind, which is what she imagines that um, the people that they were recording would think. I'll set something outside the door of my mind for him to play with and handle. The white man can read my writing, but he sure can't read my mind. I'll put this play toy in his hand. He will seize it and go away. And then I'll say my say and sing my song. End quote. Hurston's tactics recall Simone Brown's contention that dark surveillance is a way of knowing that speaks not only to observing those in authority, but also to the keen use of an experimental insight in plantation surveillance in order to resist it. The social and technical distortions in Hurston's audio recordings are traces of how her early work pushes against the classification and cultural legibility of black folk on what Paul Gilroy calls a lower frequency of resistance. In June 1935, Hurston took a folklore recording trip to the Library of Congress to Frederica, Georgia, and the towns of Belglade, chosen in Eatonville and Florida, with, Lauren, with Lomax and Barnacle. The traditional music and spoken word catalog from the Library of Congress's American Folklife Center notes more than 700 tracks from the trip, each a few minutes long. Information included in the catalog and subsequently in the online metadata comes from a recording log from the trip, which was almost certainly written by Lomax, with whom Hurston had a lot of trouble. Um, he, he was a big personality. Lomax's log comprises contextual, contextual information about the 1935 tracks 
including the technical quality and the circumstances of their making, the performances, the type of performance, the context, such as when it was a group of all men or all women, and when a third party participated in what was being collected. It seems to be a very thorough account of what probably happened. Five of the seven tracks are labeled card playing songs or work songs. Lomax's log often includes more information for the tracks and Can't You Line It? and Some Old Cold Rainy Day, for example, include the notation sung by A.B. Hicks, trained by Zora Hurston. And the tracks O Lula and Going to See My Long-Haired Baby, they're labeled as sung by A.B. Hicks under the direction of Zora Neale Hurston. These are his notes. Um, some of this information is on the notes, but not on the card. The fifth track is a similar but more detailed notation that says, Let the Deal Go Down, card playing song, sung by A.V. Hicks, trained and taught the song by Zornia Hurston for her folk opera, A Day in the Section Gang. Bellamina, a round dance recorded in Chosen, Florida, includes a notation that reads, Miss Hurston had to lead the song because the performers had forgotten it. In the online catalog, Hurston is generally labeled recordist and collector for the remainder of the 1935 recordings, except for another recording interview with Wallace Quarterman, a former slave interview for which Hurston and her colleagues, Barnacle and Lomax, are often identified as interviewers. Listening closely to the recordings and in contrast to the log and catalog, Hurston was not only recording or performing in the field on at least 75 of the 1935 recordings, she can be heard consistently and actively participating by directing information gathering and otherwise engaging the performers. In the recording of the Sea Shanty, for example, Sea Day Dawning, Hurston stops the singers to redirect their song. Just a minute, she says, it's coming out like I like it now because if you're leading, you got to come out. So I'm going to play this for you. It may not work. I may not play all of them, but you can hear the distortions in the recording. You can hear her faint voice at the end, and that's generally going to be the point for the rest of the recordings, but to save time, I probably won't play them all for you. But let's see if this one works. Ah! Do you want to touch it? That's okay. Yeah. Anyways, at this point. Uh, this is a sea panty song by Henry Bloom, Sea Sing Sound Island, May 11, 1935. All the men are pulling on the rope and singing for all their way, folks. So generally, a lot of thank you. Um, generally, a lot of recordings are like that. She'll just have an interjection. You'll hear her voice, faint, her voice faintly. Um, in this particular recording, she's working with a bunch of kids. This one, maybe we'll play one more. Um, you can only faintly hear. <laughs> So that was her voice very faintly at the beginning. Not much going on there, but she's, if when you can hear it a little bit better, she's clearly directing the children on what to do. When not actively directing the performances, Hurston is engaging with her participants by singing along and generally encouraging them as an audience participant. She's particularly enthusiastic on some of the tracks recorded in her hometown, presumably with people she knows or with whom she feels especially familiar. On the spirituals, sing, on the spiritual sangaree, Hurston can be heard laughing, singing, and clapping. Her tone is both mischievous and merry when Hurston introduces the singer as John Davis leading sangaree. Maybe there's one more under sangaree. Yeah, thank you. She comes at the end after, I think, a pause. Hey, hey! Somebody ask him who is there in the room. Do you sound still this way? Blue? Please. Stand right there, Mr. Blue. Stand right there. I'll get you loud. Stand right there. Who is there in the room? John Davis, the big talk, leading sangaree. 
Thank you. So when John Davis is telling his tales, that's John Davis who was just speaking at the beginning of that recording with um, Hurston at the end, um, she responds encouragingly laughing and sometimes screeching with hilarity. During John and the Bear, she says John was always tall-talking, wasn't he? And during John and the Coon, she confirms the storyteller, he must have been telling fortunes beforehand. On other recordings, Hurston is concerned with the recording logistics, such as when she asks on Chain Gang, chain gang Holler, which we're not going to play, um, to the loud group before she gets off, now everybody on the porch, could you please not, when she gets cut off. Um, there are both social and technological causes for these distortions and for the catalog's lack of representing Hurston's participation in these performances. In the first instance, Hurston's influence was not recognized as authoritative by her white collaborators. Being a participant observer was not an uncommon practice at the time. And Lomax, Lomax often sang with the people he recorded, and Hurston's absence from Lomax's descriptions means he did not find Hurston's role in the recording substantial enough to note. The continued silencing around her participation in the online metadata is the legacy of Lomax's choices. The catalog is the basis for the metadata that is used for online discoverability through indexing and search engines. The information originally collected by Lomax is fit into the MARC catalog standard, which has been the schema used to describe and catalog cultural artifacts, including these recordings in the Library of Congress for digital representation since the 1970s. Um, 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 the relator terms in the MARC standard, which identify the roles that participants play in a recording such as these, are restricted to tr traditional roles of influence. As such, there are no terms that correspond to collaborative roles that demarcate the kind of director, active audience member, or enthusiast role that Hurston could have occupied. Instead, in MARC terms like stage director are reserved for, quote, a person or organization contributing to a stage research resource through the overall management and supervision of a, re of a performance, end quote, which would not have been identified um, as Hurston's participation. Technical distortions also mark why the recording law of the metadata and prevailing scholarship for these artifacts allied the complex and influential roles that Hurston played during the sessions. Distortions on the recordings may result in sound that is missing garbled, or it may introduce noises that the audio engineers decided to smooth over or delete. Distortions on all the tracks of John Henry's stories told by John Davis present as clicks and static on the recording. The digitization notes on John and the Rival track indicate that a, quote, slight mistracking midway through recording results in a noisy playback. And the last group scripts on John and the Bear, the static makes the stories almost inaudible or di difficult to discern, especially when, as you heard earlier, Davis is animated and expressing a rising tension between the characters about whom he speaks. The more emphatic Davis becomes raising his voice and quickening his speech, the more laughter he encourages from his audience, and the more cacophony of sounds there are, different voices, different lives, laughter and static blending together. At such moments, it becomes difficult or impossible to distinguish the words Davis is saying from the surrounding noise. Notes about the recordings when Hurston is speaking to and singing with the little girls, playing games mark a bad strip. The voices wow and warble on the recordings, warping to a higher pitch so that everybody sounds like a small child. I'm going to go ahead. Um, so edits could have easily included deleting incidences of Hurston's voice as she often speaks at the beginning of a song, in between songs, or after a piece. And audio editors may well have deleted other incidences of Hurston's voice from these recordings in order to diminish the presence of what they perceived as distortion and for the sake of preserving what they considered more authentic or significant content. Considered differently, the distortions resonate with Hurston's own ethnographic practices, precisely because they introduce complexity and a pluralism of meanings, forcing scholars to suspend more traditional notions of authenticity and authority. The distortions are useful traces of, traces of the processes that help to produce Hurston's complex positionalities during her time and in present scholarship on her work, especially when scholars do not have other evidence in the archives. But it is difficult to link the recordings directly to her writings. On the recordings, origins are fuzzy, and the evolution of the tales from teller to writer is unclear because there's only occasionally an audible word or two that can act as an indicator to the written text. Words like bear, pa panther, tub, on the clothesline, among other phrases, are audible, but trying to track how these words and concepts correspond to her literature is difficult. Mostly what is audible is the storyteller's exuberant barking, catcalling, whooping, and raucous laughter, all of which are meaningful. 
the words indiscernible, but the tone discernibly joyous, especially that of an unnamed woman in the background who cackles on and on as though the idea of John outwitting Massa is the funniest thing she's ever heard. Distortions introduced in how the 1935 recordings were cataloged, edited, and digitized diminished the means of authenticating Hurston's voice and the stories as the same as those in her text. But it also transforms the recordings in, into interrogative texts and their production into an invitation to question the scholarly processes scholars engage when considering her work. Is this Hurston or not? becomes a less productive question than how is authenticity and authority functioning both in the moment of the recording and in current scholarship around Hurston's black folk work. These shifts in perspective bring an analysis of the recordings closer to Hurston's own practices of deconstructive ethnography, which includes confronting the players of power in our processes of interpretation that catalog my people. The presence of social and technical distortions in Hurston's recordings resist simplified notions. They are a reminder that space and time and personhood are relative to the tools and people at hand. On the recording, she sounds present. I hear her as an active and authoritative voice, but the co-presence of socio-technical distortions on the recordings and associated logs and metadata resist my own practices of subjectivation, and that would name her and that would have her name her subjects, many of whom still remain unnamed in the recording log and the resulting metadata. Yet the socio-technical distortions in the recordings that mark her absence and mark possibilities for residence invite conjecture, opening up the recordings as interrogative texts and inform alternate understandings of Hurston's complex representations. Levers that reveal frequency disruptions, sounds can be tools that disrupt the history-making processes of authority and subjectivity so that it can hear them for what they are. Methods are for fixing identity and time and place in order to construct a history and culture that serves a particular narrative. So I'm going to end here and conclude um, with a couple of things about trying to sort of turn this work into a mathematical model. I'm getting, I'm almost there, I promise. These days I'm sort of more inclined to close listening than distant listening. Um, and one of the things that I would suggest that we pay attention to as humanists in order to get to some of these issues comes from a, a last quote by Zorno Hurston, where she writes, way back there when hell was no bigger than Maitland, man found out something about the laws of sound. He had found out that sound could be assembled and manipulated, and that such a collection of sound forms could become so definite and concrete as a war ax or a food tool. So my sort of question is, how do we make this into more of a food tool than a war ax? Um, and I would suggest to humanities or digital humanities scholars that we need to learn more about audio data curation, audio analysis tools. All of this work requires some sort of technological know-how. Um, accuracy thresholds, what does it mean to be accurate and who does it serve? What questions does it serve? Scalability, who gets to do machine learning with audio and video? These things require a lot of computational power. The projects that I worked on, I had access to a supercomputer, but who has access to a supercomputer? Um, sustainability, are these kinds of resources sustainable in the long haul, not only environmentally, but in the context of scholarship that in many cases can be fleeting or loses significance over time when we get into a data space where it's about neural networks instead of about particular people in a moment in time. Um, and then finally, I'm going to conclude with plugging my new project, <laughs> which is uh, Audi Annotate, and it's really a means to allow people to do annotations of specific, um, specific audio and video uh, objects and cultural heritage institutions so that this sort of close listening practice can have a, a better means of dissemination, but can also contribute to sort of the lack of definite metadata and cultural heritage collections. I'm going to leave this here for questions. Thank you.